make sure that's recording. Okay, hi. Welcome to another edition of VidMag Interviews. Today we have Cleveland's legendary reggae rocker, Carlos Jones. Welcome, Carlos. So, how long have you been doing this thing that you call straight? Uh, it's been good 38 years now. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I was listening to all kinds of music, um, you know, as a kid growing up. But um, when I uh, got into reggae in the mid-70s, and then especially after I saw Bob Marley live here in Cleveland, that just kind of flipped the switch, you know, and it's like, that's what I want to do, you know? Yeah, I can certainly understand that. I mean, there's just so much that goes into reggae. I mean, there's the feel, there's the flow, there's the soul, there's the, I mean, yeah, it's a big spirit, man, that you know, everybody feels it and just like gets pulled into it. And, and, you know, when I'm watching it happen from where I stand and just seeing the diversity of all the people who are like all on the same vibe, like, hey, what could be better? You know? Right. Yeah. And I've noticed, too, you know, I mean, even people who can't dance get flowing. I yeah. mean, they get the rhythm, they get the feel, and they even if they just way right. they're into it right and from the youngest there. to the oldest you know and no matter you know their background it's like everybody just like just lets it go you know? right right well it, like at the uh the playhouse square show that that you just got done doing that came out so great there were the little kids there that were yeah. running around and yeah. dancing and blowing bubbles right. and playing yeah. and on stage with you hit playing clapping yeah. and playing the tambourine yeah and that's one of my favorite things um, a lot of times uh, when we have shows like that outdoors where people bring their kids, uh, I'll bring kids up on stage to like play drums and you know just kind of join in and, and you know it's, it's like the purest energy, you know? Right. Yeah. Um. All right. Before we go into too much depth on anything, there's something that I'm kind of curious about that um, you brought up at the Playhouse Square show. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind the purple cowbell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of a spin-off of the whole uh, Christopher Walken, more cowbell thing, you know, that everybody knows about. But uh, uh, my good friend Donna Bell, um, she just started bringing this purple cowbell to the show because I'd always, like, put out a, a thing where, like, yeah, the show is going to be awesome and uh, all we need is just more cowbell, you know, so she started bringing this cowbell and it just became a thing, you know, so she comes through the shows and she brings the cowbell, so I just grab it and add it to mine, you know, and then it's just like one of those, uh, you know, audience participation things that just caught on, you know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to that whole thing about everybody getting into the movement and the flow and the spirit of the whole thing. Right. So, so all right, so let's go back a number of years um, and uh, why don't you kind of give us a little background. I mean, you've been in a number of bands, First Light, I Pal, um, obviously the Plus Band, you've done some solo stuff as well. So why don't you, you know, kind of give us a little bit of a... Okay, uh, you know, uh, I'm an army brat, so my family jumped around from place to place. We're originally from Virginia, um, but uh, my dad moved us like every couple of years, you know, according to wherever he was stationed. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of years in Germany, uh, Frankfurt, Germany in the mid-60s. Um, I was one of those kids sitting in front of the TV set when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, and that just blew my mind wide open, just like so many other people. And um, when we got to Germany, we didn't have TV for those couple years we were there. So it was all about the radio and records and whatnot. And I had one album to my name, it was a Beatles album. I played it till the grooves wore out, you know. And um, so that was my first like real immersion into popular music. And I wanted to be a Beatle. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, my my dad had the hardest time convincing me and my brother that we couldn't like wear our hair really like the, like the Beatles had, you know. But we wanted the pointy toe boots and uh, you know all of that. Um, but uh, I really became interested in drums, you know, from listening to the, the Beatles records. Um, 
on my mom's side of the family, uh, it was all like church and gospel kind of stuff, you know. So I was really influenced by uh, gospel music, especially Southern, you know, Baptist kind of stuff. You know, every every summer we'd go back to Virginia and visit my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, and um, my great grandfather, well, great great grandfather, built the first church in that little town called Scottsburg, Virginia, in 1876. And that was the same church that we were all going to, like right down the road from my grandfather's house. Um, you know, every Sunday, my grandfather was a preacher, um, my uncles were deacons, you know. So that spirit of that music just really is in my blood. Um, and then um, at my grandfather's house, there was an old piano that uh, I, I came to find out was my great grandfather. He was a music teacher. I discovered his old acoustic guitar stuffed away in an old dusty corner and I used to pull that out and pluck the strings. So that was my first like musical instrument that I really got to experience hands on, mm -hmm. you know, and I was really fascinated with that. So, um, so Beatles, gospel, and then uh, all of the old 45 records that were, you know, from the 60s, um, Stax, Atlantic, uh, Motown, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, that my cousins were playing and we'd sit out on the front porch and sing and try and imitate, you know, James Brown, Al Green, Temptations, whatnot. And so all of that just kind of, you know, that's my musical background. Uh, when we moved back to Cleveland uh, in uh, 68, uh, then I was listening to uh, just anything I'd get my hands on, you know, I'd play my, my folks' old records with the blues, which was, you know, Sinatra, Tony Bennett, you know, a lot of the big band stuff, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, you know, whatever I could listen to, I was absorbing all of that. And, uh, you know, of course, I was still listening to whatever was, whatever was popular on the radio, mostly the soul stations. Uh, WJMO, WHQ, those AM stations, you know, I'd go to bed at night with a transistor radio under my under pillow. Under the pillow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and so I just soaking all that stuff up, you know, and then uh, I, I became uh, exposed to, like, the Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, uh, you know, uh, all of the, the classic, uh, what became known as classic rock right. of the time, you know, started listening to that stuff. And, uh, and uh, fast forward to mid-70s, and uh, I remember hearing an artist by the name of Johnny Nash, okay. you know, who was uh, an American artist, but he was recording Jamaican songs, you know. He was collaborating with uh, Marley and, and uh, what would become the Whalers band, and recording songs like Stir It Up, Guava Jelly, um, one of his most popular ones was uh, I Can See Clearly Now. Okay. Uh, so I, I heard that, and so between him, Harry Belafonte, Jimmy Cliff, you know, I started to hear the early uh, pioneers of, you know, what would become reggae music. Roots reggae. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. The Caribbean. Right, too. right. And, uh, and then I heard Eric Clapton's version of I Shot the Sheriff. You know, I heard his version before I heard Marley's version. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, or any of the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, Clapton definitely was the one that exploded that yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, and there were other rock artists. You know, that were kind of like dabbling. You know, I mean, Stones were like heavy into. Actually, you know, of course, uh, a lot of the punk bands were uh, really akin to reggae artists. Uh, you know, the Clash. Was, Stones and I mean, uh, so many, so many American artists were, were going to Jamaica and like really kind of uh, immersing themselves in that sound. Mm -hmm. So uh, I heard Clapton's version, uh, and then one day on some some TV show, I don't know what it was, but I actually saw Bob Marley and the Wailers. Actually, it, it wasn't even Bob Marley and the Wailers at the time. It was the original Wailers, you know, with Peter and Bunny. And uh, and I heard them doing I Shot the Sheriff and Stir It Up, and I was like, whoa, what is this, you know? 
That yeah. was probably like Don Kirshner's rock concert. Something or like that. Special yeah, special yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, man, I was just like captivated. And so um, uh, I, I went in search of that sound, you know. And then my brother, uh, my older brother, who uh, was in the military at the time, he came home and he brought this album called Natty Dread, you know, which was one of Bob Marley's earlier uh, solo albums, you know, when he split off from the Wailers and formed Bob Marley and the Wailers. And I started listening to that thing, and that was it, man. I was hooked. And so being a drummer, uh, more, more specifically a percussionist, it was the beat, it was the rhythm that mm -hmm. just really drew me in because I was like, wow, it's like, uh, it's not exactly that one, two, three, four, it's kind of backwards, you know? And so I just really wanted to find out what was behind that, you know, and, and how it was made and what it was about. So, um, you know, still living at my mom's house, but, you know, had my whole percussion set up down in the basement. And so uh, that along with, uh, you know, some good herbal substance, you know, it just really took me deep down the rabbit hole. And, uh, and that led me to really starting to listen to the words and, and what he was singing about. And uh, the, you know, the oppression and the social issues of the time and things going on in Jamaica. Much of which is still going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, still going on. So, um, yeah, that all combined to just really, uh, you know, hook me. And, and, and when I heard him singing about positive vibration, you know, that kind of brought me full circle to, you know, a lot of the teachings that my parents had instilled in me about, you know, positivity and you know, doing unto others as you have them do unto you. And, just, uh, it all just kind of clicked, and so that kind of led me to, um, you know, just just really, you know, growing the dreads and trying to discover as much as I could about the actual culture behind the music, and not just the stereotypical surface stuff that, right. you know, a lot of people just seem to kind of roll with. I love um, reggae music. Yeah, yeah, I really yeah. don't know much about what it's all about, but I love the... Sound. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all right, you know, because I mean, a lot of times it just leads people into an, uh, a a good kind of positive feeling, right? And it's all good, man, you know. Which uh, is why this the reggae um, podcast is going to go on in January because it's going to be like a ray of sunshine in yeah. the winter there. So <laughs> yeah. I can see yeah. where you're coming from on that for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, then I I actually got to see uh, you know. Bob Marley in concert in uh, 78 at Music Hall in Cleveland. And man, that was just such a spiritual, I mean, a religious experience. Well, it's been transporting. Yeah, yeah, just feeling that vibe and just seeing the whole scene. It's like when I close my eyes, I can still see it, I can still feel it. You know, the place was packed. It was just full of smoke. It was pulsating. It was just like, you know, wall to wall, corner to corner, just movement. Everybody just, it was a wave, you know, mm -hmm. and on stage all the lights and the color and the, just the vibe just emanating from, you know, not only the band, but just that one little dude just like had, had it all under control, you know. And it's a small intimate theater, it's only 3,000 seats, and so every seat is a great seat and, yeah. and the sound just washes over you anyway yeah. in that hall. Yeah. So I could, I could just imagine what kind of just... Yeah, it was a wave it was, of just energy yeah. that pulsate and circulate throughout that room. It was totally immersive, you know. And so I, I just came out of there a changed person. I, I, I tell people I, my, mo my molecules were rearranged that day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just like, man, I, this is what I want to feel for the rest of my life. So um, shortly after that, um, I discovered that there was a local band in Cleveland that was playing reggae music. Uh, well, you remember the Coffee Break concert? Yes. Uh, yeah, and I was at work one day and the Coffee Break concert was on. Matt DeCass was talking about this.
Okay, so uh, it's on yeah. the concert. Yeah, so uh, at work listening to the Concert Bay concert, Matt the Cat was talking about this local reggae band called Ipo. And you know, they were playing some songs. Oh, really? Here in Cleveland? Open the So I was like, gotta go see. So uh, they had a um, they had a, a, a regular gig at this place called the Coach House uh, down in University Circle. Okay. So, you know, a little shack. And uh, yeah, my brother rolled in there, and uh, you know, again, it was that scene of just like that just pulsating vibration that everybody was plugged into, like full of smoke. <laughs> and uh, you know, the band was just on it. And, and so, uh, you know, I was like, well, I gotta get a piece of this, you know, and I walked up to. Uh, uh, the guy who play, plays tambourine next to me, uh, George, George, George right? Gordon, yeah, I walked up to him because he was one of the members of the band and, and I started talking to him and I was like, man, you know, what is this and who are you and, you know, and uh, I, I, I was that guy, I was like, I've got bongos in my car, man, can I like hang out and sit in and jam and he goes, oh, yeah, that's cool, but you need to talk to that brother over there and that was uh, Dave Smeltz, who was the leader of the band. So I went and talked to, to Davey, and he's like very welcoming, and very cool, and very iry, you know. And he's like, yeah, man, come hang out, you know. So I grabbed my bongos out the car and sit on the side of the stage, joined him in, jammed out, and uh, I just started following him around, and, and just never left. And eventually they hired me. So uh, that was my start, you know. From that day to this, it's just kind of been a snowball, you know. Great. Um, yeah, and and uh, one thing about your music is, um, he, I mean, you do some of the morally political kind of material a little bit, but the majority of what you do is not political at all. It's just very uplifting, yeah. very spiritual. Necessarily, as much as it is, enjoy us, feel us, you know, experience us. Yeah, it's, and, and it's the impression that I get from your crowd. And it, you know, it, it, it's more a thing where I just want people to participate in that feeling of joy and upliftment and unity. You know. Um, we have a lot of songs, and, and there's a few shows that you've seen of us, you probably heard like maybe, you've heard a small fraction of the right. stuff we do. Uh, we play, we have a lot of songs in, in, on our list that have that political and social message, and you know, sometimes they'll get folded into the rotation. Um, but I'm not really trying to beat people over the head with like, you know, fire and brimstone, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm more about positivity and about peace, love, and unity. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that old saying, a spoonful of sugar makes, helps the medicine go down. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, you know, make people feel good, they'll be more receptive to what you're trying to say. So, um, you know, I, I will, you know, give them that sugar and get them in there and get them to dance and get them moving and then I can like inject you know that reality and, and sometimes something that might not be quite so pretty uh, and just say hey this is what it is you know what do you think about that mm -hmm. kind of thing yeah, yeah was, Steve Bader has told me in, in the first interview that I ever did with him back in I think it was like 81 or 82 or something like that um, when Lords of the New Church had put out the song Open Your Eyes. He said that it was probably the most subversive song he had ever written because um, it told people open your eyes to the lies right in front of you and but it was a really catchy hook and so people would be singing along with it and only subconsciously would they be getting that message and that's uh, apparently you know, like the kind of thing that you're trying to do 
that's where, like you said, you're not trying to hit anybody over the head, but you want them to get that part of it when you do that part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it kind of worked out pretty well that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you know when people's hearts are open, and you know there's not so much a, a brain thing. It's not their you know there's there, it's not their mind that they're operating on. It's from a, a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know have something penetrate to that part of them, I think it tends to stick more, you know? And it's not like you're trying to so much change the way they think or insert your own ideas into them, but just present something to them that they can, you know, consider, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's gotta be kind of difficult, though, to be able to come up with, uh, with, with songs that um, resonate on a local level when they deal a lot with like the Jamaican issue. I mean, some of the problems that they've got there, we've got here, the racial stuff, especially recently with all of this stuff going on with the police and the Black Lives Matter and all that other kind of thing going on. Um, but um, do you think that people are getting that connection? Uh, yeah, because I think, um, like you said, some things are universal, you know, and I focus on those things, like human rights, uh, you know, I mean, there are abuses going on everywhere in the world. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, and when it comes to things like family, you know, and, and, and love, and I mean, all of these things are, are things that we all experience and deal with, and so... Yeah, when you say one love, one heart, let's get together and feel all right, it's not just a Jamaican thing, you know, it, it's a human thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's the important thing, is to bring out the humanity in the cause yeah. in order to be able to make the cause something that people are going to want to get involved with, because if they don't feel the humanity, it's just like, man. Yeah, they everything. can't relate to it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's a lot of parallels, you know, historically, you know, uh, in the Jamaican story and the American story, you know, and so you can draw those parallels, you know, in a song and just say it in a few words and people can see, oh, well, you know, we're the same, we're the same. Mm -hmm. How do you um, go through a writing process? Your band is pretty extensive. You got the two lead guitars who were both just absolutely fabulous, I, I have to say. When Charlie and Max trade off leads, I mean, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, actually, mean, Charlie's the bass player. Ghani is the other guy. Ghani, player. okay. Yeah, yeah to, 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 to have two lead guitarists that have that kind of, of, of Respect, level yeah, and, and everything. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Peter on the keyboards, but it sounds like in an orchestra of forms, like a brass orchestra behind you at times, and things like that. So, and then of course you've got the different percussionists going, and then when you get into it, and you do the drum, especially my bingy with the big drum, yeah. which I think is really cool, and I definitely wanted to talk to you about that separately, anyways, yeah. because that seems to be something special to you. Um, so how do you go about putting together a song that encompasses all of that? Uh, it, it's really, uh, you know, our, our process is really kind of unorthodox, I guess you could call it, because we don't really rehearse, you know. We, we, we don't practice, you know. I, I'll introduce a song and give them the basic structure, like chord structure, and uh, maybe if I have the bass line, I'll play it and Charlie will pick it up, and then we just kind of like freeform and improvise to it, you know, just kind of ride, I call it what riding the wave, and, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that we've never practiced, because in the, <laughs> in the beginning, you know, of course we had to have rehearsals to start to build our, our playlist, especially the original stuff, because a lot of my originals are not just the simple two, three chord structure, you know, they actually have arrangements. So, you know, we have rehearsed to a point, but, uh, you know, when it comes to just a groove, set up a groove, and then start to ride that, 
and the guys just kind of have this innate sense of like where to be and, and how to get out of each other's way and, and respect for that space and uh, that's what creates that pulse mm -hmm. um, so I, I just I can't say enough about uh, you know the, the level of musicianship that they bring to the table um, they're all so much better than me and, and you know that's what you do you align yourself with people who are better than you and it makes you look good <laughs> <laughs> well there's definitely a really smooth flow like when going from one solo into the next uh -huh. or, you know back to you and then into another solo on the other side yeah. or something and then back to you and then you get George up there and he's obviously getting into it with the tambourine yeah. and the dancing and everything yeah. and I mean it just totally enfolds yeah. The, yeah. The, the whole thing so, so let's talk about Naya Bingy. Um, what is the um, the story behind that? That's apparently an African thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Naya Bingy itself is 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 the form of drumming that originates. You know, it's how it has its roots in Africa, but uh, it originated uh, as a form of really not so much protest music in Jamaica, but rebellion music, you know. And uh, it, it's named after an African queen, Naya Bingi. And the basis of it is to kind of like beat down oppression, negativity, and uplift the positive, and, and, and strengthen you know, those who are fighting against you know, that oppression. And it, it's very ceremonial, it's very ritualistic. You know, it has a, a basic structure in the heartbeat. Uh, you know, it's, it's very rudical, if you will. And just straight from the heart, straight from the earth. Um, that doom, doom, that the heartbeat, the universal rhythm, you know, and the, 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 the bass drum is like, boom, you know, that's that downbeat, that's the one drop, boom, the one, and then you have the several other drums called the funde drums, which are playing, you know, there could be several of them playing a, And then you have what's called the kete, which is like the voice which is speaking and, you know, calling out to the people to come together to lift up themselves from the oppression, to, you know, push back against those who would oppress, you know, and it's speaking in like kind of sentences like in a high pitched voice like so it's kind of interspersed uh, uh, you know between the heartbeat and the boom. Boom. yeah so um, there was a, 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 a rebel group um, called the Maroons in Jamaica who uh, you know basically killed off their slave masters and escaped to the mountains in Jamaica and uh, you know this was part of their you know ritual and uh, it, it really goes a lot deeper than I can you know coherently explain right now but uh, that's basically what it is it, it's rebellion music and it's also uh, like the most foundational form uh, from which reggae music sprang you know, um, and so that's what I was hearing underneath the music when I first got exposed to it. I could hear that underneath, mm -hmm. you know, and that heartbeat. And I was like, what is that? What is that? And, uh, and I found out that was Naya Bing. Uh, there was artist uh, uh, Count Ossie is one of the earliest uh, uh, pioneers of bringing recorded Naya Bingi music to, you know, you know, to exposure. Uh, Ross Michael and the Sons of Negus, you know, another one of those artists who 
highlighted Naya Bingi music. Um, Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, uh, who has a home in Jamaica, he befriended a lot of the uh, uh, Rastas uh, in that area where his house is and brought them in to record a whole album of pure Naya Bingi music. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, called and he called the group the Wingless Angels. Hmm. Yeah, he actually has two albums now. Uh, I'm gonna have to look at that. Yeah, because as you know, Keith Richards is one of those guys who respects the roots of you know the music that he's into. So that's why he's such a like you know uh, heavy proponent of blues music. Right. And so when it comes to reggae, you know he wanted to go deeper than the surface and 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 bring to people what was the foundation of reggae music, which is Naya Bingi. So he brought these guys together at his house and recorded them playing Naya Bingi, and then he added, like, in, you know, guitar and, and bass. And kind of like Stuart Copeland did with the Africa yeah, series that he right. did. And like what well. Paul Simon did, and too. And Paul Simon yeah. and Graceland and then the new, the new record. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that song, it's, 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 it's so resonant, I mean, that drum just, even, even in the outdoor setting, that drum just puts out a pulse, and you can feel that pulse, even outdoors, and, and that's why I knew that there was something special about it, because the, just the, the expression you get on your face when you do it, it's very solemn, it's very intense, it's very into what you're doing you're very focused on that particular song possibly more than a lot of the other songs that i've ever seen um you know i mean you've always got this joy on your face when you perform because you're feeding off the audience you're feeding off of you and that back and forth going on but that particular one you just have this different sort of feel about you and so that's why i thought that that might be something very special and I think that that would be a really good place to end the interview because that is very special. Alright, so. well I'm just going to say one thing about that. I call that big drum. I call it by many names. I call it the one drum. I call it the mother drum. I call it journey to the center of the earth. You know, it's a journey to the center of your soul. And so when that vibration hits it like penetrates everything and everyone and that's what I feel you know when I play that drum I'm on the highest mountain top I'm in the deepest valley I'm by the river I'm by the ocean it's like all of nature it's all of the universe all rolled up in one thing it's all one feel the heartbeat yeah <laughs> thank you my friend yeah, man. great you. interview